Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of MFA Fine Arts Talks. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Coates, an artist based in Brooklyn in Lakewood, Pennsylvania, best known for her paintings and drawings of landscapes and food. Her recent work, I'm speaking of her 2021 solo show uh, at uh, High Noon Gallery, for example, depicts a world, and here I'm gonna paraphrase the words of Seth Rodney, who wrote about that show in Hyperallergic, a world of luminous nighttime revelry in which female figures rise out of the gloaming as the night deepens, cavorting with goats, hunting, eating, playing out their parts in cultic rituals in a luminously lush woman-centered forest. Take me there. Um, solo and two-person shows Jennifer has had at, well, first, um, this time last year, uh, Untitled Miami in the High New a year before that, uh, a two-venue solo show with High Noon um, at two spaces here in the city. Uh, she's shown at Pamela Salisbury in Hudson, New York, Freight and Volume several times. Um, a show at PAFA, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, Arts and Leisure, and Front Gallery in Houston. Group shows at Eric Firestone Gallery, Aquabella, Marsha Wood Gallery in Atlanta, Platform Projects in Brooklyn, National Arts Club, Marsha Wood Gallery in Atlanta, Inman Gallery in Houston, Asia Geisberg Gallery, University of Kentucky Art Museum in Lexington and Zerker Gallery here in New York City. She's done curatorial projects at Platform Projects, Freight and Volume, Ortega y Gasset Projects in Brooklyn, uh, Jeff Bailey Gallery in Hudson. Hudson? Yeah. yeah. Um, just want to make sure I got that right. And Ursa Major Arts in Great Barrington in Western Massachusetts. Her work has been supported through awards, grants, fellowships, and residencies from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, New York Foundation for the Arts, NIFA, the Civitella Ranieri Foundation, Sharp Valentis Studio Program, the Maryland Institute College of Art. She had a named uh, endowed chair for a year. You're not still teaching there, are you? No. Um, American Academy in Rome, the great one. Uh, and Vermont Studio Center. Her work has been reviewed or discussed in Two Coats of Paint several times, Hyperallergic uh, more than once, Art Spiel, Bomb Magazine, Artist Magazine, Art Critical, The Brooklyn Rail, Curator, Huffington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, Artsy, The New York Times twice, um, The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, one of the the main daily paper of Atlanta, Art News, Art Fag City, may it rest in peace, uh, New York Arts Magazine, Flash Art, and Art on Paper. And she also writes about art. She's written, published reviews, or her reviews, I should say, have been published in Time Out New York, Art in America, The Brooklyn Rail, Modern Painters, and Bomb. She received an MFA from Hunter and a BFA magna cum laude from Kafa and University of Pennsylvania, please join me in giving a warm and enthusiastic welcome to Jennifer Coates. Thank you so much. Um, just getting my notes. Super happy to see you guys this afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna start with a couple of little um, kind of research detours before I talk about my work because Research is a big part of um, what I do. And I've done a lot of teaching and a, a lot of the research I've done for various seminars or lectures I've given has made its way into my work, um, which is really cool, I like teaching. Um, so one of the things I love to read about is the history of color. Um, so not just like, cultural history of color, but also um, the chemistry behind certain colors and certain pigments, um, synthetic chemistry and kind of 
colors, origins, and alchemy is very interesting to me. And I do this lecture that I kind of change all the time, but it's based on the colors of, of the rainbow. So I'm just going to do a little, a little dive into purple just for fun. Um, so purple was the color worn by Roman magistrates. It became the imperial color worn by the rulers of the Byzantine Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, and later by Roman Catholic bishops. Um, so there's a story that purple is affiliated with royalty. Um, and change it both times. Um, the affiliation actually dates back to ancient Greek times. Um, there was a color called Tyrian purple that was used to dye togas of the rich, and they were extremely expensive because the process of making the dye was very long and difficult. Um, so thousands of tiny snails called murex would be found in the surrounding seas. Tyre was an island, um, and their shells would be cracked. The snail would re be removed, and um, mountains of these empty shells have been found in ancient sites on the Greek islands. Um, so they would remove a tiny gland from the snail, extract the liquid from the gland, which would be put in a basin, and it would be mixed with, with urine. Um, and the urine was used as something called a mordant, which is what fixes the color onto fabric and makes it so it doesn't fade in the light. How they figured that out, I have no idea. Um, the mixture would be placed in the sun and a transformation would take place in the sunlight. The liquid would turn white, then yellowy green, then green, then violet, and then a red, which would turn sort of darker and darker. And the process had to be stopped at exactly the right time to obtain this color of that, that is a swatch, um, which could range from a bright crimson to a dark purple. Um, so then the togas would be dyed, but it always had this like faint smell. <laughs> um, it always had the, the faint smell of urine. You came in at just the perfect moment where I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, apparently these vats of Tyrian purple had to be kept outside the city walls because the smell was so horrible. Um, and um, a more uh, modern um, chapter in the story of purple is um, the color movine, which was discovered by science student um, William Henry Perkin um, in 1856. He was a young British chem chemist and he was sent home for spring break um, to try to make a synthetic quinine. And his experiments produced instead this unexpected um, bright purple residue. Um, and that turned out to be the first usable synthetic dye. And it was a deep violet called movine. And um, it was used to dye clothes. So something that's really interesting about the history of these colors is that synthetic chemistry was making all these strides in the mid 19th century. And it was because of the dye industry. So it was because of the demand for dyed clothing items that the synthetic chemistry um, was able to generate like cosmetics and medicines and you know all kinds of uh, you know poisonous chemicals that are used in cleaning agents today. Um, so this color was used to dye clothes um, for just everybody, not just the nobility and upper classes, because a, a light fast purple was something that was really hard um, to make back at that time. So this was like a widely available purple. It became like the, the greatest, latest thing. And um, young William Henry Perkin became a millionaire. So um, aniline is the substance that um, he synthesized that he found this purple from. And aniline is like a totally fascinating thing for me because it's basically coal tar. It's this sludgy, gross, stinky runoff that um, coal to powered factories produced in the 19th century, just like horrible looking, horrible smelling. And um, in, for some amazing reason, it, it, it yielded like 10,000 different kinds of synthetic chemicals that were usable um, in industry. And um, it, it occurred to me when I was reading about this, like, why would anyone even think like that it, it was a good idea to experiment with like sludgy and promising stuff, but that's what they did in alchemy. So alchemy is like this ancient 2000 year old practice that predates chemistry as we know it. And what were they doing with alchemy? They were wanting to transform matter 
they were attaching sort of spiritual and religious ideas to that transformation. So the burning was something that they did a lot. So that is why there was this behavior of burning um, so that they would burn and, and experiment with this unpromising black goo, which rendered all the colors of the synthetic rainbow. Um, the last little chapter in the story of purple here, um, Monet's London paintings. He was um, captivated, captivated by the London fog, which was a notable atmospheric effect that was made worse by pollution um, in the around 1900. And he painted the Houses of Parliament, the Waterloo Bridge, um, and the Charing Cross Bridge over and over. Um, and the Impressionists were known for their excessive use of purple and pink. And it was called Violetomania by um, critics at the time. And it sort of was affiliated with the shock of the new in painting. And there was a, um, an art critic who complained that, this is a quote, earth, sky, water, flesh, were inevitably now the color of lilacs and eggplants. Faces were rendered with lumps of bright violet paint. Ambient light now only appeared as in harsh blue and garish lilac. And he said the Impressionists must have had diseased retinas. <laughs> and the reason why I like thinking about his paintings is because not only is he painting this lavender haze, um, which is, you know, pollution can kind of intensify the colors. Um, chemicals can in the air can intensify the colors. And um, he was also using on his palette and his paint, like kind of new technology um, pigments that were made more widely available due to the industrial revolution. So he's like painting the smog, he's painting the content is pollution and he's using um, the very same kind of components um, in the paint itself. So yeah, I think about color, I think like, how can I do a deep dive and look into the chemicals and the, the history of each color that I'm using and the kind of paint that I use? Um, and then the other little um, diversion that I wanna take is into, um, there's a word called pareidolia. I should have put that up on my slide. Um, it means that the human brain has a propensity to make sense where there is no sense. So like when you look up in the sky and you see all the clouds and you wanna see a face, if you look at tea leaves, you know, and it doesn't look like much, but you can kind of pretend you see things and then they come visible to you and you make a story around it. That's what our brains are sort of trained to do, to make a narrative, to make a, a picture from a pattern or from a mess. So there's this quote from Leonardo da Vinci that has influenced many artists that I love. Um, he said, if you look at any wall spotted with various stains or a mixture of different kinds of stones, if you are about to invent some scene, you will be able to see it, see in it a resemblance to various different landscapes adorned with mountains, rivers, rocks, trees, plains, wide valleys, various groups of hills. You will also be able to see diverse combats and figures and quick movement and strange expressions of faces and outlandish costumes and an infinite number of things, which you can then reduce into separate and well-conceived forms. So he's basically like, you know, giving an, an assignment. You can look at anything and kind of get inspired. And there was also this um, very kind of little known um, artist slash teacher named Alexander Cousins who wrote a book with the unwieldy title, A New Method of Assisting the Invention in Drawing Original Compositions in Landscape in 1785. And he had this really um, interesting blot method for making landscape drawings. So, you know, you think of this method as maybe being something that the Surrealists did, but he was doing it a couple hundred years before. So he would make these blots with ink and he found that the accidental stains on the paper would stimulate the imaginations of his pupils. And according to him, the ideal landscape was one that was made instinctively. The artist was to control his hand only in accordance with some general idea, which he should first have in his head. The accidental shapes of the washes would suggest natural features to the artist who could then elaborate or paint over them for the more imaginative finished drawing. The artist had thus invented the compositions rather than drawn actual places. And um, as you'll see with my work, that is what I do.
Um, another artist who worked in this super intuitive way um, in the 19th century, she was sort of an amazing mystical occult practitioner, spiritualist medium, um, and her work really prefigures abstract painting in a very exciting way. So most of her drawings were done in the 1860s, and she was British. And after the death of her sister, she says she allowed herself to become possessed by ghosts and draw their visions. She said, the execution of the drawings of my hand has been entirely guided by the spirits. No idea being formed in my own mind as to what was going to be produced. And she used um, watercolor and tiny little brushes. And so she got these incredibly ornate patterns and little lines, these little curly cue calligraphic lines. So she felt that these spirits guiding her were definitely those of dead people. And she had heard about the possibility of communicating with ghosts in 1859 and decided to obtain mediumship by holding hands with her mother at a small table for months on end. And so finally she was able to communicate um, with the dead. And um, she initially used only members of her family as guides especially her late sister, but then she later claimed to have communed with Renaissance artists like Titian and Correggio. And I, I like these spiritualist artists and their mystical ideas about communing with the dead, not so much because I believe I can communicate with the dead, but, but because sometimes it's just great to tell yourself a story to generate like imaginative ways of using your material, generate like a, a more I don't know, inspired way of, of looking at your materials and, and optimizing them. I mean, I just think they're really beautiful. Um, so Victor Hugo, um, 19th century writer, um, he made these ink drawings also. And while he was in mourning for his dead daughter, he was introduced in 1853 to table turning where spirits uh, communicate via taps of a table leg and he, with his family and close friends, produced a huge number of scripts that record their seances. And he also made these drawings of some of the entities and scenes he saw, um, sort of again, like finding images and teasing out them out of these black spills and watery washes. And um, he claimed to have received messages from about 110 different entities, historical figures such as Lord Byron, Robespierre, um, Rousseau and Voltaire, but he also communicated, he said, with abstract categories such as comedy, poetry, prayer and reverie. And sometimes he said entire countries would drop by, India, Russia, there was a man from Jupiter and then there was a talking lion and donkey. So yeah, a couple other um, drawings by him just to show because he was thinking about communicating with the dead, I think it made him more adventurous with his material. I mean, this is the one um, drawing is totally abstract and the other one is kind of, um, you know, you can make the trees out, but there's so much going on in there and so much inventiveness in letting the material sort of speak for itself. And this kind of led to a lot of, or prefigures a lot of these surrealist drawing practices that I'm sure um, you all have learned about in art history. Um, but I love I love this list um, just because some of the names are incredible. But I use some of these techniques again to just kind of get my mind going, or you know, break out of some of some of my behavioral ruts. If I'm having a kind of slow day. Um, so there's automatic drawing, which of course is free association related to Freudian psychology, where you just kind of, you know, let your hand move and see what happens. Automatism, which is using a liquid media and letting things kind of drip and spill and follow the logic of um, the liquidity. Um, a great word, decalcomania, from the French word decalque, which means to transfer a copy by tracing. So that's when a surface like glass, metal, or coated paper is partially covered with paint or ink and the surface pressed against a piece of paper. And you can get these kind of reticulated, lacy, um, beautiful, intricate patterns from doing that. Frotage, laying sheets of paper over textured surfaces and making a rubbing. Grattage, coating a surface with layers of paint while still wet and pressing it against objects to leave imprints. And then there's fumage, 
drawings made with smoke held near paper. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of this artist, Ethel Calhoun. She was a British surrealist and occultist. And she was an amazing painter and writer. And she wrote an essay called The Mantic Stain in 1949. And I just love this quote because it really kind of um, sums up what's interesting to me about, you know, kind of teasing out content from accident. It is that branch of surrealism known as psychomorphology, which concerns us here. Psychomorphology is the discovery by various automatic processes of the hidden contents of the psyche and their expression through different media. The principle of all these processes is the making of a stain by chance or objective hazard. To use the surrealist term, the gazing at the stain in order to see what it suggests to the imagination and finally the develop developing of these suggestions in plastic terms. And what's interesting to me about um, the surrealist drawing practices, like as I showed you, there are some artists that were using spiritualism, um, you know, making work before surrealism that, you know, was kind of met, seeing into the mess, doing that pareidolia thing, but a very ancient practice of divination. Um, and you, if you look up ancient divination practices, you can find Mansi, the, the suffix Mansi or mantic is knowing. So there are all these prefixes, like literally you can find a divination practice for like, I don't know, throwing nails on the ground and reading them. Like there, there are these kind of codes of how you read the occurring patterns. So there's capnomancy, reading smoke, seromancy, when you drop, drop molten wax or lead in water. Abacomancy reading dust, Brontomancy reading thunder, dendromancy by trees. Of course, there's tassiography, which is reading tea leaves. Scrying, which is looking into reflective objects or surfaces. And my favorite one, um, the study and divination by use of animal entrails usually the victims of sacrifice. And this is an ancient um, Greek and Roman practice. And the word is haruspice. So the people who performed this were known as haruspexes, which is, love that word. So um, now finally, get to my work. I'm going to close this now. My notes, because I can talk about myself without notes. Um, so I lifted the dead cow, obviously, from this ancient Roman sarcophagus. Um, and this work is about four by five feet. And um, I use acrylic paint and spray paint. Um, this is a little bit before my spray paint days. But acrylic paint, to me, speaks of the history of synthetic chemistry. Some of that stuff I talked to before about before, it's it's very much related to plastic, to like nail polish, to car paint. Oil paint sort of has its history more in like fleshiness and, you know, kind of natural pigments dug out of the earth. But acrylic paint is more about um, plasticity and, and, and the synthetic. So for me, that's embedded into the content of my work. And this is a very, I like to work with texture. So the entrails that are like rising up out of this dead cow um, are very, very textured um, and I guess I was thinking about it, the cow's entrails kind of like produce this whole environment, this abstracted confectionery landscape around, around it. Um, and I'm just gonna start, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna motor through some stuff. So I hope you can handle this. Um, I, I, I had it right before the pandemic, I was lucky enough to have a residency at a, in a castle in Italy, in Umbria, and it was amazing. My little apartment studio overlooked a garden and I would just go into this garden and draw every day. And I got to see some of the like local frescoes in the churches and Renaissance frescoes plus Italian landscape made me a very happy person. So I, I made all of these little drawings while I was there that all started from a spill. And then I would kind of find my landscape motifs and find my drawings in the spill, sort of just starting to use this like pareidolia idea. I'm gonna merge with the spill and find characters, find a sense of place. Um, this one, I think that the stain is asserting itself a little more and it's like, find the cow lady. Can you find her? She's kneeling by the, the tree. 
Um, and these two horse figures, well, I'll talk about them in a second. Um, I was taking, I was lifting these animal, using these like animal headed figures and lifting the heads from uh, art that I would see um, in my travels. And there's a wolf headed woman in there. She's preaching to the birds that's lifted from a St. Francis of Assisi preaching to the birds by Giotto. So I was just kind of grabbing, grabbing from the world, grabbing from the landscape, grabbing from my mind and grabbing from the art that I saw. And that's how I like to do it. There was a lot of olive trees and like bay, bay leaf bushes and rosemary bushes. And it was very idyllic. That was my spot. That was my friend, Philip, experimenting with watercolors. And um, these were just some amazing frescoes I saw and I'm including them because I had never learned about them in any art history class. It's um, this, these brothers, the Salambani brothers, and there's this beautiful series of frescoes in um, Urbino. And I, I, you can, maybe these little horses look familiar. Those are the guys that I lifted. Um, but I just loved the, this way of kind of making like stylizing and making pattern out of the leaves, like the local trees become these kind of confectionery colors. And it's like, you know, they have a system for how they render the trees and the landscape. And that's, that's important to me. This is me in my happy place with my book of the frescoes in front of the olive tree. Those were good times. Um, Another place I saw that was very influential is, um, uh, it's called a monster park in Bomarzo. Um, and there are these huge stone sculptures um, that are situated in the landscape. And I became really fascinated by the idea of, of not necessarily painting figure, painting figures, but painting scul sculptures of figures that somehow that, that remove gives it like a ghostly kind of presence to me. So this is like November 2019. And then the pandemic, blah, blah, blah. We're all locked in our in our houses alone. Um, and I became obsessed with, with these images of the triumph of Pan. This is by Poussin. So it's a French Baroque artist. And Triumph of Pan, there's a, there's a pan um, in the middle, a sculpture pan, and then all of these people kind of falling all over each other, drunk, um, hysterical, breathing each other's germs. That was something we couldn't do at that time. And I was, I found a lot of solace somehow, like painting these interlocking figures. So these are, um, that's what I was looking at. And I, there are other artists that were, inspired by Poussin's paintings as well. This is Picasso, the work on paper. Leon Kossoff, Kossoff made an etching um, of the Triumph of Pan. Bob Thompson, really great painter. You should look into who he is if you haven't, if you don't know him. And um, of course, all of these, they're called Bacchanals. So it's just drunken bad behavior in the woods like legitimized by the figure of Pan, these goat-headed or goat-bodied deities sort of say, yeah, it's okay, you can do this. So this was my first um, depiction of the triumph of Pan. It's, it owes a lot to the Picasso work on paper because you've got to start somewhere. But I'm really, I, I was really interested in like the negative spaces between the, the limbs and how they're mirrored in the negative spaces between the, the tree branches and then echoed by the rocks. Um, and so this idea that you could merge into each other and merge with the landscape and that that would be echoed in how the figure and the ground merge. So these very kind of formalized ways of thinking of painting, figure and ground. Um, you know, I've got, I've got my spill and I've got the lines on top and they're talking to each other and kind of, you know, having harmony and merging. And then these figures are merging with each other and merging with the landscape. So for me, that was that was fun. Also, I learned that pan is the prefix of panic, pandemic, pandemonium, which is kind of what we were all going through at that time. So it had another level of meaning for me. This is a five by six foot version from 
late 2020. Um, and most of the figures cavorting in the landscapes are, are women or men with breasts, kind of intersex figures, but there's a, there's a kind of matriarchal vibe that runs through my work. And I'm, these, these sculptures of Pan in the landscapes, they're called herms. And in ancient Roman Greek times, they were like these boundary markers. They were like sexualized boundary markers that would kind of show you the way through people's properties or mark the edges or be in gardens. And that, that just seemed really interesting to me. So some more lifted figures from a ancient Roman sarcophagus. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this painting, but Botticelli's Primavera, it's on umbrellas and coffee mugs and sheets and who knows what. But I find that, you know, not all artworks that are infinitely reproduced lose their magic when you see them in person. And when I saw this in person at the Uffizi, it really blew me away. And it's so dense, you know, you've got these little tiny flowers carpeting the, the ground and fruit in the air. And they're like botanically specific flowers on the ground. And I think there's like hundreds of different kinds. And I, I kind of just love this idea that you're like recycling classical figures, right? Things from ancient Greek and, and Rome. And um, you've got like this kind of dictionary of, of natural things, like a dictionary of all the different flowers. It's just like a, it's, it's like a picture that hangs together, but it's got this really interesting kind of history and like science um, affiliation to it. And so this is a, a painting of mine, six by eight feet. So it's rather large from my last show in 2021. And um, it's hard to see in this image, but there are all these little profiles of, of goddesses, of women, of dryads, and dryads are tree spirits. So um, this is sort of my like nocturne primavera uh, painting where I'm, I'm cataloging instead of botanical specimens, these are like the weeds that grow in the ditches in Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania, where I spend time in the summers. And it's a catalog. I think there's like 50 different kinds of moths fluttering around. Um, let's look at some details so you can see the heads in there and they're really glowing and there's a lot of texture. And, and I like to do this thing where the, the, the texture, which is sort of an accident, echoes some of the very purposeful marks that I make with a small brush. And then there's gesture and there's spray paint so that there's a, com a, a conversation between different kinds of mark making um, in the painting. There's a little detail. Another six by eight foot painting from that show. Um, yeah, again, the, the kind of run of the mill wildflower ditch ecology. Um, this is maybe a little later in the summer, things are starting to kind of uh, crinkle up and, and fall over and die. And the um, the dryads or, or tree spirits are a little more embedded um, in the landscape. And I took the, the, um, the birds from a, an ancient Roman um, fresco which I'll show you in a second. So there we go. It's hard to tell the, the, the face from the flower. Um, so this is a, a big influence on me. This is um, uh, it's an ancient Roman for a painting of a garden. Um, and it was in that, uh, it's called the House of Livia. So this woman, Livia, had... Uh, the outside brought into her, um, I think it was like a basement dining room with no windows. It was just, you know, the pictures on the wall. And, and the thing that's interesting is that there's birds from all over Italy all put together in one scene. And there's flowers and plants and trees blooming that would never bloom all together. So again, it's this idea of like, like aggregating, like cataloging, like making a kind of visual dictionary of the surrounding landscape and making something 
synthetic, something artifice, something that would never quite exist like this in, in the natural world. Some details. Um, another six by eight foot painting. This one is from last year. Um, it's called Diana Nemorensis, which means Diana of the Woodland. So Diana is the goddess of the hunt. Um, and I, I really love when I'm thinking of the mythological figures, like I research what they looked like in different time periods. So, and, and I, this is from a, a 19th century sculpture. Um, I look at sculpture, I look at painting, the, the two dogs, those are her hounds. Those are, she was often depicted with hounds in Baroque times, Baroque depictions of D Diana. And the trees are like, you know, run of the mill maple trees in uh, rural Pennsylvania. And all of the flowers are just things that grow kind of wild. Um, again, in Pennsylvania and all the birds, it's like a catalog of the birds of Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, there's a little detail. So I have a lot of fun with finding paintings within the painting. So there's a, like her hair is a painting within the painting. The space in the arrow is a painting within the painting. Um, I like to just think of these little zones, like what if I just took this out like and make a fully realized kind of mini world. And so the birds are paintings within the paintings and so are the flowers and so are the dogs. Um, another ancient, this is an ancient Pompeian fresco from a place called the House of the Golden Bracelet. And I just can't get enough of these, these images. Um, and I like these also for how they incorporate paintings of sculpture. So you've got those herms, the heads on the columns, and then these kind of painted, I don't know if they're reliefs or, or what, but they're, it's playing with artifice too. It's play, playing with what it means to make a painting within a painting and painting sculpture. It's just kind of a cool, weird thing because these are so alive. Like they're, they're supposed to be sculptures made of stone, but, but they really look human. These are some Herms, Pan and Dionysus, the gods of bad behavior, my favorite. Um, this is from last year as well. It's five by six feet. Um, it, that's a, a Herm of Dionysus in spring. So there's a robin and um, that snake. The shape of it is taken from an ancient Egyptian tomb painting. So it's sort of stylized, almost like a hieroglyph. It's a milk snake though, again, like a run of the mill snake. And that section in the middle is very textured, very, very built up. And I like to sort of think of that's the pareidolia moment, like where you're projecting the, the negative space becomes this thing that pushes forward. And maybe you're seeing a head in there with a beard. Um, there's a close up. Again, just playing with lots of different ways of using the paint, letting it do its thing. In, in every way that I can think of. Another herm, more like a fall herm with a luna moth and a deer. Um, these are female herms, um, the heads embedded in the weeds, um, herms and butterflies. So again, the butterflies are like the paintings within the painting. Again, I'm playing with texture and spray paint. Um, Here's a close up. My favorite moment when I knew the painting was done is when I painted that that sort of dive bombing butterfly it gave it sort of a weird menace. <laughs> um, so my my husband and, and I have had a a place in in Pennsylvania for almost twenty years, and I go on a lot of walks, and I refer to these ditch weeds. I, I take pictures of them, I draw them, I'm fascinated with them. Ditch weeds, basically it means that there are, there are types of plants that really like poor soil and they thrive at these edge zones. So where like farm meets road or woods meets cultivated, like there are these edges and um, Queen Anne's lace and thistles and goldenrod, and this is called a mullein. 
um, I guess the flowers have a narcotic effect and, and it's mentioned in Homer's Odyssey. Um, they used to, and that sort of like, what's the word, semi-anesthetize fish before catching them with nets with the Malayan tincture. Um, and then when I'm back in the city, I'm in Greenpoint, which isn't the most kind of nature-y uh, place, but I find it where I can. And there's this uh, one fence right around the corner from my studio that has this prodigious like uh, morning glory that grows on the fence and it's always optimal in September. And I, I love to take pictures of it and look at it. And there's also a nature walk um, at, near the uh, wastewater treatment plant that's across from my studio. Um, if you follow the unpromising signs to the nature walk, it takes you to the Newtown Creek and there actually is really interesting stuff growing um, right by the super fun site that is the Newtown Creek. Um, another little diversion, um, the Nabi painters are very influential to me, especially this very much lesser known Nabi painter from the 19th century, Paul Serousier. So there was an artist colony in um, Brittany in France in the 19th century that attracted a lot of artists over a period of decades. And there were women there who wore these um, headdresses, these habits that would change for different times of day, for different times of the year, depending on how old you were, you'd wear a different one. And they would have these kind of, it's like a pagan form of Catholicism. They would have these kind of mystical communions in the woods. And many of the male artists that would go made these paintings of these women kind of in these enclosed circles, the men were not allowed in, but it, it's my feeling, my theory is that these kind of proto-modernist painters were like jealous and like somehow the mystical occult communions that were happening um, triggered their minds and in, into kind of new ways of painting. So a lot of these painters like prefigure abstraction, they start to favor like bright bold colors over naturalistic colors. Um, these are some of his later landscapes. So it's just a little more free with what color can do, a less beholden to what they were seeing. And in, in, in my imagination, it's like a, they're having a kind of substitute mystical visionary experience inspired by um, the women that they were watching. This is a Maurice Denis painting that I love. Um, I think it's called Eternal Spring. So they're picking these little ane anemones. Um, and I love how you know, pattern becomes something really important for, for uh, Maurice Denis in this painting. Things are just very alive. There's like a lot of energy. The, the surface is really activated. So you, you have a sense of, I don't know, like an inner experience. It's not just a depiction of, of the landscape. So um, some more of my drawings. Here are my women um, communing with each other in the landscape. Landscape is sentient with eyes in the ground. Um, this is from the spring. It's a um, smallish painting, 16 by 28 inches. But um, again, like even on the small ones, the surfaces get really, really jammed up with information. And I layer and layer and layer and edit and paint out, paint in, paint out. Sometimes it feels really like foolish and crazy. Uh, until I get kind of excited by something and it's like, okay, you can, you can live, you get to, you get to live. Another small one. Um, so I'm really interested in Dutch still life painting again, because of how it, um, like creates these kind of visual dictionaries. Like there's flowers that don't belong together that bloom in different seasons. There's insects that are inside in this case that would never be seen all at once, but it's just this kind of voracious, like let's collect stuff and jam it all together. And there's this um, running narrative with a lot of Baroque still life of the vanitas um, subject, which is like, you know, life is ephemeral, death is sort of haunting everything and the flowers represent the kind of ephemerality of life. Um, Rachel Roish is my, probably my favorite um, 
of this genre, it's called forest floor still life. So instead of having flowers in a vase, they're put together very uh, unnaturally, but um, in, in a forest floor. So they're not inside, they're outside, but they don't belong together. And they definitely don't grow in the dark. Um, they don't bloom at night. Um, but I just like this idea that you would be kind of making this poetic construction while observing, you know, things very literally. Um, another painting of mine, this is five by six feet, um, and I'm showing this in relation to those Dutch paintings because this is an example of me. Like the tree is a yew tree. It's based on yew trees, which are found mostly in, in England. They were the site of kind of pagan gatherings and then churches were built around them. They often are kept around for hundreds of years and they grow really large. They're very ancient and they have all this meaning. There's cemeteries sometimes um, around them. So I've got the yew tree, I've got the poppies, which are like a narcotic affiliated with sleep. Um, the leopards uh, have a mythological significance to Dionysus. There's a little head there that the butterflies are coming out of. That's a head of Dionysus that was dug up in the Roman sewer. And butterflies are sort of doing a behavior called mud puddling, which I didn't know this until recently, but butterflies like he, poop, blood, corpses, and mud. They, they feed on the nutrients in these things. So everything in this painting has a kind of, I don't know, like death-ish-ness. <laughs> but it's also an opportunity to explore color and composition. So. And these are some images of my references. You can see Dionysus riding on the leopards, the opium poppies, the giant old ancient yew tree, the Dionysus from the sewer, and these disgusting butterflies feeding on, I don't know if it's feces or a corpse. Um, some more drawings. I, I was born in England and I recently made a trip back to Cornwall and Cornwall is a very magical place with um, Neolithic henge stones and a history of witchcraft and occultism and just the trees in England, I don't know, walking through the woods, they have this very animated feel to them that's very specific to that place. So this was based on a walk I took and there's this little rabbit in the foreground who's maybe having some kind of hallucinatory psychotic break. <laughs> um, magpie in the tree, another bunny having an edge experience. <laughs> and this was, these were the woods that I walked through just to sort of show you that it's all true. Yeah, right? They like to walk in England. They walk everywhere. I mean, the, yeah, I could just live and die in these, in these English forests. Um, and I also visited the Museum of Witchcraft and found some choice items. Um, and like I mentioned, there are these Neolithic prehistoric um, stones standing stones. So Cornwall, there's a lot of granite. It's mostly granite. Um, and I guess this is like a passage tomb. There's some kind of ritual that you, you that you move through the circle in that, in that stone and it's, it's like a death ritual. And um, I saw some of these, they're, they're called dolmens, they're passage tombs. And they're, they're these sort of tabletop structures and some of them look very precarious. Um, but sometimes people would be buried there, or it's just about passing through, or they had a kind of orientation to the sun, um, like a like a like Stonehenge sort of sundial kind of thing. Some of them are, you know, you can kind of go through and go underground, and there was grave goods, things would be buried with people sometimes. But I became kind of fascinated by them after my trip to Cornwall, but also after a very traumatic surgery I had last January where I had an organ removed. It was like a lot of pain and a lot of recovery. And when I was able to start drawing again, 
Um, I was thinking about these passage tombs. I was thinking about anesthesia and sleep. That little guy on the sleeping man is Hypnos, the god of sleep. Um, there he is. I stole it. <laughs> totally okay. And I, I was thinking about these mystical ancient structures and I'm wondering, oops, um, are that what would be the, I like to look for the contemporary version of it. And I stumbled in my relentless midnight, you know, Google image searching that there are these um, bunkers from World War II um, that resemble very much these kind of mystical, the mystical simplified architecture of the passage tombs. And it just struck me as like really wild because in these more recent versions of, of you know, a portal into the earth, people are hiding, they're hiding weapons, you know, they're waiting to like shoot somebody or, you know, maybe they're hiding supplies and then Neolithic prehistoric times, it's this beautiful kind of like passage from life into death that is just like a very different behavior, but similar shapes. And I, I just find that really fascinating. Um, so this was the first little painting I made of a, of a bunker portal. Um, 12 by 12 inches. And the um, oh, the plants in these couple of paintings have to do, uh, well, this is evening primrose. It's like a, a pain relief for, for women. Um, this is motherwort. It has a kind of sedative effect. So I was getting really into learning about the plants and what, what their purposes are. Um, Again, the leopard, then there's a nymph or tree spirit upside down, and that plant is aconite, which is, um, or witch's bane. It's like a, a witch, a poison witch's plant. Another upside down nymph. We're kind of wrapping it up here. Um, this is another tiny painting, and I, I kind of started getting more into depicting the trees as like, liquid or in the state of decay, again, letting the paint kind of do what it wants and maybe the trees are sort of falling over and, and dying. Um, I work on this paper called Yupo paper. It's like a plastic paper, um, polypropylene. It's made up, it's very durable, very smooth. And I love what liquid media does on it, the way it kind of spills dry has really helped me get even more painterly with um, my larger pieces. And I visited some bunkers in person. Apparently there are some abandoned bunkers in the middle of Pennsylvania um, that I only recently learned about in a town called Alvira. Actually the town was destroyed during World War II by the um, US government. These were supposed to um, be like weapons um, warehouses but they were never used. So they kicked everybody out of the town and built these things that were never used. And now the, that's me pretending to be a nymph. Um, I mean, they're amazing though, because they follow the kind of ancient principles. There's like, there's holes in the top, you walk in, there are these curved spaces. The sound is really different in there. And you instantly want to start singing. It just surrounds you in this really weird way. And then all the weeds that I love are growing up around these um, abandoned bunkers. There's graffiti, great stuff inside and out. I had like a mystical experience myself. I did. I was like, I am walking around in my paintings. How can this be real? It was very exciting. It's a little drawing. Um, and these are my, my most recent paintings. This is four by five feet. We've got some blue coyotes and little green katydids resting on dying ditch weeds and a little bunker portal entrance in the background. Another small painting. So I didn't want to just go, oh, cool, bunkers. Let me put a bunker in it. Like that seemed too kind of gimmicky. So I've been um, more recently looking at abandoned um, mines all over the world, different kinds of mines, abandoned wells, like just abandoned factories, 19th century factories, stone ruins, and thinking about 
remember I said about the dolmens that sometimes they look very precarious, like thinking about how to embed like maybe something precarious in the composition. And I'm having really a lot of fun painting these, these rocks. So this is an unfinished painting, six by eight feet. And I'm thinking about, I think I'm gonna put a pan in that dark area. It's like Pan's Grotto, but it's this sort of, I don't know, ruins and crumbling kind of stones. And I like the idea that things wouldn't quite make sense. I'll maybe put some nymphs in there for a little bacchanal. And um, another unfinished, very recent, I just took this painting, uh, this image this morning. These are based on sculptures of um, from a Greek myth about a woman who bragged about how many children she had and um, the gods rained arrows down on all her children and killed them. So there are these um, sculptures and paintings that depict um, people succumbing to arrows. Um, and I just wanted to play with this idea of like kind of maybe deathly dance and that these sculptures are like ghosts, they're disappearing, everything's a little bit precarious. I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking about, but you still got those ditch weeds and the little butterflies, those disgusting, badly behaved butterflies. Um, and this is my last image, uh, sculptures being dwarfed by some like, there's a, there's a town in Pennsylvania called Centralia that had a coal mine underneath it that's been burning for 60 years. And the images of the fire coming through the earth, through these stones, like very much captivated me. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. And I kept it under one hour, which is totally amazing. Thanks.